when the the doctrine of the trinity is discussed the, the talk very often turns to the first chapter of john's gospel now if you if you read this chapter with with uh, trinitarian glasses on then it can seem to fit the doctrine of the trinity but if you change your assumptions just a, a little tiny bit then uh, you get a completely different picture and that's a picture that's consistent with the rest of the bible uh, this video is the first in a series which looks at this picture of Jesus. Uh, we're looking at passages in the Gospel of John, and we're looking at several different passages. Uh, and these show how Jesus isn't God, but is the Son of God. So if you find this interesting, subscribe to the channel, click on the notify button, and we're going to look uh, just now at the real meaning of John chapter 1. So there we are, that's the, the passage we're thinking about. John chapter 1, first three verses, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Trinitarian case for this starts off uh, with this idea that the, the Word is God, clearly spoken there in, in, the, in the Scriptures. Uh, it's there in the beginning and it's active in creation and the trinitarian makes some assumptions about that first of all we assume that the word is actually a a being it, it, it it's a creature is the wrong word but it, it it's it's something with a mind uh that can can think and do things and it's identified entirely and exactly with christ jesus it's not just a question that the the word happens to be a mention of jesus at this point but the word has to refer to jesus and to no one else those assumptions appear at this stage and they seem to be backed up uh, by verse 14 the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we've seen his glory glory as of the only son from the father full of grace and truth so question the trinitarian asks is doesn't that prove that the word is jesus now there are actually a, a few little problems with the translation here the first problem is uh, john 1 uh, verse 1 this phrase the word is god and this is a bit of a tricky phrase because in the greek it's the wrong way around it doesn't really say the word was god it, it seems to be saying god was the the word or god was yes god was the word seems to be the, the the phrase for it and various other translations have come up with uh, different uh, variants of that so the translation is difficult there um there's an alternative translation this is from the from the net version of the bible new english translation and it says the word was fully god um the new english bible the revised english bible have what god was the word was so this idea that the, the word is identically equal with God isn't quite what the Greek expresses there. That's not the most important bit, but it is something that makes one think what's going on in this translation. And the other thing that comes up is the idea of, of the pronouns here. Uh, and you'll see that whenever uh, you get this read in a modern version, anything, the authorized version, anything later, you get he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Without him was not anything made that was made. Um, and in English, if something has the word he next to it, we expect it to be a person. Now, uh, the problem there is that in Greek, there is no such thing as a personal pronoun. Uh, the word he can um, apply to an inanimate object just as well as it can to uh, a person. Uh, they're the same. Uh, so the pronoun there could be it as easily as he it doesn't have to be a personal pronoun at all and you could get something uh, like this it was in the beginning with god all things were made through it without it was not anything made that was made so the fact that there's the word him there in an english translation doesn't necessarily mean that the word is a person it, it, it's just the way it's translated so what is the word? The question we have to ask is, is it identically equal with Jesus? Does this, this word, the word, 
always refer to Jesus Christ wherever it appears? And the answer is no, it doesn't. Now we answer the, the word in Greek, ho logos, um, and it appears 318 times in the New Testament. And if you, you have uh, a Septuagint, the, the, the Greek translation of the, uh, the Old Testament, which was available at the time of Jesus, uh, then you'll find there's another 905 times that that word appears in the Old Testament. So you've got more than 1,200 times the word appears, and it's translated as words, saying, account, speech, communication, talk, other words as well. It's never the name of a particular individual being. It's just the ordinary word that means word. It's talking about someone expressing themselves so what do you mean when you say the word word so you could speak a word i'm speaking words at this moment so a word could be something that's spoken or you could have it in a different form you could have the same word written down the person who decided what was going to be said instead of speaking it writes it on a piece of paper and then actually have to do either of those it could just be a word that you think and don't express at all. It doesn't come written down. It doesn't come spoken. It's just something that's there in the mind. And a word can be expressed in many different ways, in many different forms. Uh, and the same is true with the word of God. In the Bible, you find the word of God is expressed in many different ways. Um, here's an example. The word of God in creation. So we've got, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. And it's definitely talking about speech there. It talks about this being by the breath of God's mouth. So God says a word and it happens. And the word appears in creation. And there you are getting the same. And God spoke and it came to be commanded and it stood firm. So here in, in this psalm, the word of God isn't a particular separate being it's talking about god's speech god has expressed the thoughts of his mind as a speech he said let there be light and the universe comes into existence here's another one it's the word written down uh, your word is a lamp to my feet a light to my path psalm 119 so it's a, a psalm which is talking about the scripture available to david when he wrote that psalm and um, the idea of, of the scripture appears over and over again in that psalm, practically once for every verse. And uh, it's talking about scripture. The word here is the, the word of God written down uh, for everybody to read. It's God's written word. There's another one in, in the prophecy of Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah says, the word of the Lord came to me. So it's coming through a prophet, in this case, the prophet Jeremiah. And the prophet uh, acknowledges that word. He speaks the word of God. He says, thus says the Lord. And then he quotes what God has said. So the word of God here comes through a prophet. Here's another example, this one in the, the prophecy of Zechariah. And again, we've got the word of the Lord coming to the prophet Zechariah. But the, the way in which it comes is an interesting one, um, because uh, it's the word of the Lord that comes. But it comes and by an angel coming and talking to the prophet. So the angel that talked with him, that angel is the word of God. So we've got uh, the word expressed in an angel. Now, there's a, a general principle here that occurs throughout Scripture, which is that God reveals himself to human beings through other beings who are not themselves God. God might express himself directly. That happens sometimes. But where that doesn't happen, God can reveal himself through other beings. Those beings aren't God, but they reveal what God is like for the time. An angel can do that. Uh, prophets do that. Judges do it. Um, so the word of God is God's expression of his purpose by whatever means he chooses to express himself. Uh, 
we just seen all these different ways that God expresses himself. So it's spoken in creation, we saw it written in scripture, we saw it through an angel revealed, we saw it revealed through a prophet and written down the scripture. And all these different ways are the word of God. God expressed himself in all these different ways. And then he expressed himself in the greatest way that God has ever expressed himself in Christ Jesus. And that's what John's gospel is about. So the word of God is whatever means God chooses to express himself. And the greatest of these expressions is in Christ Jesus. So what about John 1 and verse 14? Remember, we've got all these different ways in which God has revealed himself. And early on in John 1 verse 1, he's talking about the word of God. It starts off in creation but it's whatever way God chooses to express himself. And now having expressed himself in creation through prophets, that also comes up in John 1, we've got the word expressed in flesh, so expressed in, in a human form, and this is the Son of God. Notice it says the Son of God, it doesn't say God. So, um, we've had a look at what the word of god is it's not identically equivalent to jesus it's uh, whatever way god expresses himself and it's not until verse 14 that we find the word also is expressed as jesus christ so we've looked at, at, at what this phrase the word means in this chapter does this explanation make sense um tell us what you think in the comments down below let's move on john chapter 1 and verse 18 now here we've got a, a, a translation issue it, it's an interesting passage a very important one but there's a translation issue some versions have only god some versions have only son why is that well there's a difference in the manuscripts um it's only a one letter difference uh, that's what uh, the the phrase would have looked like in the uh, uh the manuscripts of the first, second, third century AD. Uh, that's a sigma. It had a form that looked a bit like a C at those times. There's an epsilon. It looks like a U. Uh, or when you get U, epsilon, sigma, with a line over the top, that's uh, a, a, an abbreviation for huios, which means sun. If you get theta sig sigma with a line over it, that's an abbreviation that means theos, which is God one letter difference they two look quite similar um especially when you're handwriting and trying to read it in a by one candle at night or something like that then it's easy to substitute one from another now interesting the translations since 1980 pretty much go for only god translations that were made before 1975 every single one of them goes for only son or only begotten son why the difference have there been more manuscripts being discovered since since 1975 well no uh, in fact no manuscript discovered after 1955 has the text only god all the manuscripts discovered after 1955 have the text only begotten son um something strange is going on here and I think it's in, in the mind of the translators, and particularly in the fact that uh, most of the people who buy Bibles are Trinitarian, and they only buy Trinitarian Bibles, and this is a, a change that makes your particular Bible a little bit more attractive in the market. Anyway, let's think uh, how one could see what's going on. The witnesses to the text We've got three variants. There's actually another one that comes up occasionally about once. Um, but a small number, we've got a papyrus, we've got uh, four unseals, we've got one translation into Georgian, um, which have only begotten God. For only the only begotten God, we've got a different papyrus. Someone has seen the Codex Sinaiticus and corrected the grammar because only begotten isn't begotten god isn't really grammatical it would have to be the only begotten god is corrected the grammar we've got uh, a correction to uh, the codex sinaiticus we've got a minuscule here and we've got 
a translation into the Boharic uh, dialect of Coptic. All the other witnesses, and there are many thousands of these, have only begotten son. And in fact, you can plot these on a chart. There you go. Each of the dots represents one witness to the text. Um, the chart's made so that witnesses that are similar come together. And you can see that it divides up. It's quite consistent the way it does divide up. The ones down here are referred to as Alexandrian witnesses. The ones up here are Byzantine. And over here we have witness sorry, Western witnesses. And uh, what this tells us, first of all, there are very few witnesses to variants which refer to the word uh, made flesh as God. Um, those God variants are all Alexandrian. They all come from the same part of the world. Uh, and it suggests that there was a, a defective manuscript around there at that time and people copied from it and then realized it was wrong and stopped doing that. Um, so the more likely text is something like that. No one's ever seen God. The only son who's at the father's side has made him known. So let's see the reasons for that. First of all, vast majority of the witnesses support only son. It's only a few that have only God. And those witnesses are all from the same place and time. Um, second point, the, the phrase monogenes huios. This is the Greek phrase that, that's being translated here, and we've got the word monogenes. Now, that word monogenes is never used for God. The Greek for God is monos theos, um, for one God or only God. So here, it's the wrong word. It fits very nicely with uh, huios, the only begotten son. It's a regular phrase in the Bible, but the words monogeos theos never appear anywhere else than this verse if it appears here uh, much more likely that it should have been monogenes huios the only begotten son and last is the internal sense of that passage it says god has uh, never been seen so if god never been seen how does god uh, declare him but god's never been seen so the only son declares him that does make sense what does it mean? Well, no one's ever seen God. It's the first point, point about it. No doubt about the text here. No one's ever seen God, but thousands of people saw Jesus. Great multitudes came to see him. At one point, he, he fed 5,000 at the same time. So many, many people saw Jesus, but no one has ever seen God. And that implies that Jesus is not God. That's what you work out from there. And instead, we've got no one has seen God, but Jesus shows us what God is like. And that's what that verse is telling us. Uh, it's expressing the, the, the general message of that part of John's gospel. No one can see God, but Jesus shows us what God is like. In fact, it's the message of almost the whole of the gospel of John. Certainly, it summarizes for us the message of the, the first 18 verses of John's Gospel, the prologue. So there you are, the diagram of the prologue. It starts off verses 1 to 3, and it's talking about God's word, which begins with the creation. And it goes on to talk about John as a prophet, another way in which God has expressed himself. And then in verse 14, it says, and this word is now expressed in Jesus Christ, and Jesus shows us what God is like. And that's the, the, the point of this 18 verse passage right at the start of John's gospel. Now, it's not the only time that uh, John's gospel talks about the nature of Jesus, certainly not even the, the only the time that uh, John chapter one speaks about the na nature of Jesus. Um, here we've got Jesus returning, to the river Jordan where John the Baptist is and John sees Jesus coming towards him he says behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world so he's identifying Jesus here and he, he told his disciples that he's seen and born witness that this is and he says the son of God he doesn't say God he says the son of God and this is a 
a way that Jesus is consistently described throughout the Gospels. Uh, and in the case of John's Gospel, right at the end, there's a, an epilogue, there's another chapter after this, but at the end of chapter 20, which is the end of the main message of the book, we, we have the same thing. The reason that John's Gospel is written is to show that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. So the Gospel starts with the statement that Jesus is the Son of God, and the, the main part of the Gospel ends with the idea that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that's a, a common form that was used in ancient literature. It's called an inclusio, a sort of bookends. It starts off with the message it's interested in, and it ends up with the, the same message repeated. And it's telling us that everything in between is about Jesus being the Messiah and the Son of God. In fact, the Messiah also appears in John 1, the, the, the word. So John, John's gospel is about Jesus as the son of God. Notice um, here John the Baptist has a wonderful opportunity to say who Jesus is. And he says, I've seen, I've borne witness that this is the son of God. John the Baptist is very uh, certain to tell us that Jesus is the son of God. Uh, John is with his disciples. He's slightly apart from the crowds that are gathering around. He's talking to his disciples about Jesus. He has the perfect opportunity to explain who Jesus is and why Jesus is important. And he chooses to say Jesus is the son of God. Now, it would have been a good time to say Jesus is God. This is God in the flesh. He doesn't say that. It's only a good opportunity if Jesus is God, if Jesus is not God, then he'd say something like, Jesus is the Son of God, which, of course, is the way Jesus is described throughout the Gospels. And the fact that John the Baptist says that here shows that Jesus isn't God, because it's the perfect time to say that Jesus is God, if Jesus is God. And you get that over and over again throughout the Gospel of John. Here's a passage from John chapter 3 says god so loved the word that he gave his only son it doesn't say god so loved the word that he came to earth to give himself he says god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son again it's a passage it's telling us jesus is not god well uh, this presentation is part of a series which looks at what john's gospel tells us uh, about jesus and there are several more presentations to come so if you find the subject interesting subscribe hit the notify button and look out for the rest of the videos and let us know what you you think of the videos uh, by putting something in the comment below mm -hmm.